We okay? Right, good afternoon everybody. Sorry about that. We've uh, been decimated this afternoon with, um, with COVID. So I'm just sorting out who's here and who's apologising and um, who's um, subbing for whom. So, welcome and housekeeping arrangements. I'm going to hand over to Rachel, if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Housekeeping. In the event of a fire alarm sounding, please take instruction from staff and stewards. The assembly point is at Judah Square. Please can I request everyone to switch mobile devices to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. The meeting today will be webcast and the recording will also be available for people to view later through the Council's website. Whenever the meeting is open to the public, photography, video and sound recording of the proceedings is permitted. However, the Chair has discretion to withdraw or suspend this permission, for example, if the recording is disrupting the conduct of the meeting or is being undertaken in a manner which could capture personal information, or in the events that a member of the public participating in a meeting objects to being recorded. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Right, and just for the benefit of people that are watching this online, I'm going to bob around the room and ask members to introduce themselves. So I'm starting out with Councillor Garbutt. Peter. Uh, Peter Garbutt, Councillor for Netheredge and Sharon. Bernard. Anne Murphy, councillor for the Manor, Castlewood. Chris. Councillor Chris Rosling Josephs, uh, Baton member. Pete. Councillor Peter Price, member for Shay Green Brightside. Bob. Councillor Bob McCann, uh, councillor for Baton Ward. Andy. Uh, Andrew Sanger, councillor for Forward Ward. Roger. Roger Davison, councillor for Ecclesall. Richard. Yeah, Richard Williams, uh, councillor for Stanton Wood. And Alan, you're the last person I call on today. Uh, Alan Woodcock, councillor for East Ecclesfield. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any apologies for absence, Rachel? Thank you, Chair, we do. We have councillor Brian Homeshaw, and in substitution we have Bernard Little. We have Tony Dams, and in substitution we have Anne Murphy, and we have apologies from Councillors Peter and Councillor Gary Weatherall. Thank you, Chair. Are there any items for the exclusion of public and press? I haven't seen any on the agenda, and I don't believe there are. That's right, Chair, there are none. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand over to members now for declarations of interest. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, for item number two on the agenda, that is the um, one on uh, Abbeydale Road, um, I've been involved in this case, and so I'll be recusing myself from this case. Thank you. And it's just a reminder for those members who are substituting, who weren't here for the deferred item um, at, the, at the last meeting when it was heard, that um, because they haven't had the opportunity to listen to the full debate, we will be asking them not to speak or take part in the voting on that item. Thank you. Now we have minutes of the previous meeting. Um, they start when I've flicked through on page nine. I'm going to go through them for accuracy and then ask you to approve them as a, an accurate record. So, any matters arising on page 9? Page 10. Page 11. And page 12. And can we agree that those minutes are an accurate record of the meeting? I can see nods around the room, so thank you very much. Um, the next item on the agenda is site visit. 
Um, the date of the site visit is in, in members' diaries and the Secretariat will be in touch if we have any site visits, any applications that we need to see before the next meeting. Um, I can't believe it's eight minutes past two and we're already on to applications and the various acts. I'm going to trip myself up now, aren't I? So um, the first application we're looking at today is item 7A on the agenda. It's a full planning application for a change of use to a residential institution, Class C2, and it's at 16 Collegiate Crescent, Sheffield. Um, would you like to um, present the report, please? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, thank you. Collegiate Crescent um, um, is our first item. It's number 16 at Collegiate Crescent. Um, the property is a Victorian villa, villa-style building, currently in use as a C3 dwelling house. Um, it's located, as we can see from slide number four, please. Thank you. To the northern side of Collegiate Crescent. Um, and perhaps slide number five, please. Where immediate neighbours are dwellings of a similar size and character. We located in Broomhall Conservation Area and the Nether Edge and Broomhall Housing Area. Um, as can be seen from the aerial on the current image, it's a large property it's set well back from the highway. Perhaps we please may look at um, photograph, uh, sorry, slide number six. Thank you. Set well back from highway um, behind a, a, a substantial lawn and, and uh, um, um, a wall, a perimeter wall with supplementary hedgerow. Um, okay, so the, pro the proposal, sorry, initially, uh, firstly, we've received a supplementary, re uh, um, uh, there's a supplementary report covering this item. Um, just two elements to that. Uh, firstly, as, and by way of clarification, an item received from the applicant. S sorry, Chair. Um, can I just clarify? Did you say there was a supplementary report? Correct. Right. Can I just uh, ask, Chair, have members been made aware of that supplementary report? Can members indicate whether they have received that, that report? Um, Hang on just a second, we will make sure that you have seen it. Thank you for your indulgence, Stuart. We've all had copies of the report now, so if you want to indicate the supplementary report that you'll be speaking to and allow members to uh, read through it as you're, as you're speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, by way of slow pricey, um, we've, there's two elements to the supplementary report. First is the additional written statement provided, supplied by the applicant. Um, on 9th of April, uh, officers received uh, some additional detail um, uh, regarding the maximum capacity, residence capacity, of the, of, for the proposed use, um, and that is to be between six and ten residents. Um, also stated was that they don't envisage any uh, changes to the parking provision at the site, uh, the vehicles uh, parks on site would be those of staff and occasional visitors um, with staff and residents making good use of the public transport links uh, along Collegiate Crescent. 
Um, second element to the supplementary report is an additional neighbour representation that was received on the 11th of April yesterday. Um, I'll not summarise those items now. I think we've covered only 10 points there and then responded uh, uh, as, as officers uh, to those points raised. Um, so nothing really to draw out from that um, 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 for myself for now, um, I don't think. So that's the supplementary. In terms of the proposal, the proposal is for uh, a change of use from its current use, which is a standard C3 residential dwelling house, to a C2 use, use class C2 use, which is a residential uh, care setting for young adults with autism and learning disabilities. Um, the, use it's, the proposed uh, change of use itself is to the C2 use. And the extra detail I've given there was clarified throughout the process of the application. Um, in terms of external changes, uh, there are no external changes um, uh, to the property, to the site uh, proposed, and no internal changes uh, proposed either. So we've seen the slide on uh, number six. If we can just return to that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's the property view from the street. A closer to photograph is slide number 10. So again, you can see the substantial front garden and the, uh, the, the, the size of the property. Uh, further photographs show the, the depth of the property. Um, um, if we can look at slide number 12, please. Thank you. And then slide number 13 shows some of the uh, outbuildings and uh, parking, parking hard standing areas also. Thank you very much. The surroundings uh, um, um, are largely uh, large residential properties. Um, officers have, um, have surveyed the area and in the immediate vicinity, um, it's considered that over 50% of properties would remain as C3, um, that's C3 standard residential uses. Um, so it wouldn't result in an over concentration of non-residential uses uh, that, that would threaten the residential character. It's envisaged that, that there may be three to four visits per week to each resident and that there may be five slash six staff on site per day um, with a skeleton nighttime staff also. Um, there aren't any, any internal alterations as mentioned. However, it is realised that an alternative C2 use may require a different kitchen arrangement, cooking facilities, perhaps hygiene provisions and so on. So as a, re a result of that poss possibility, there is um, uh, conditions to cover extra plant equipment uh, and noise related issues, odours and so on and so forth. And that's a condition that's within the recommendation. Um, in terms of highways implications, it's estimated, again, as photograph, the current photograph shows and, 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 and other images uh, and facilities on the site. So there's provision for at least six vehicles off site. So there's no concern that there'll be additional on street parking pressure arising from the um, 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 proposed change of use. As we've said, there's uh, no concern that the residential character of the area would be uh, um, affected uh, and, and duly affected by the proposal. And it's considered that the relevant policies surrounding that uh, would be satisfied. In terms of um, comings and goings, as you might say, uh, uh, limited numbers of act activities connected to that. So it's not felt that that would be a cause for, cause for concern. Um, in terms of the recommendation, as you'll have seen, it's recommended for approval subject to a number of conditions. Um, there's a directive that covers, that advises about uh, perhaps parking, 
uh, hard standing alterations, external changes and so on, that they may need planning permission and that they will need to be sensitively designed in order to um, be aware of the, uh, the, the, the context uh, and lo location within the conservation area of Broom Hall. So I'll just hand back to Chair and thank you very much. Thank you for that, Stuart. I have one speaker on this. Uh, Stuart, would, would you like to? Thank you. I, I have one speaker on this application, and that's Mr. David Cotton, who's speaking against the application. Um, Claire, are you going to make sure that the microphone works? And yeah. It's a very interactive meeting, is planning. Thank you. Mr. Cotton, if you'd like to um, make yourself comfortable, the button um, with the... That's okay. Super. If can you, you hear me? I can Everyone, hear you okay. most, most certainly. Um, the floor is yours, Mr. Cotton, for up to five minutes. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm David Cottam, I'm the chairman of the Broom Hall Park Association and a resident of Collegiate Crescent myself. The association is 50 years old now. Sorry, no, it's okay. That's fine, thank you. Sorry, Sorry about that, Mr. Cotton. We'd got, we'd got you labelled as Councillor Mick Rooney. It would have been very confusing for the people who would have been looking at the web. And they think, where's his hair gone? But there you go. So the five floor minutes, is now yours. Our five minutes starts now, does it? <laughs> okay. So the, the association I represent is 50 years old, 1968. It was established to protect Broom Hall and to support the council's aim of restoring the area to residential use. Uh, our principal objections are the over-concentration of non-residential uses in this part of the Collegiate Crescent and secondly, your officer's report, which we feel fails, fails to give regard to the valid planning concerns and it does not apply relevant policy correctly. Before I go into the detail, I just wanted to say we are surprised that the, app the applicant has purchased this building for around a million pounds without obtaining planning permission for this use change unless they've been given the green light by your uh, colleagues. Your policies confirm C3 uses are this preferred use in Broom Hall and that non-housing must only occupy a small area and not lead to a concentration. However, if approved, the area in question will undoubtedly deliver a massive concentration. Your officer's report states 50% of the properties will remain C3, but it's unclear how this assessment has been made. What area did she take into account? The whole of Broom Hall, Collegiate to Crescent or the immediate locality? If number 16 changes to C2, of its four immediate neighbours, only one will be C3. We've got nursing home and an office. Concentration of 80%, in our opinion, will there be, therefore be non-residential. Given either approach, it is absurd for the officer to argue that this represents an acceptable level. Uh, it is contrary to policy. Additionally, her report does not address the historic context of Broomhall Park which is highly resident, relevant and key to residents' concerns regarding the loss of another residential property, and it should be of primary interest to you. Brilmo Park is already very diverse, with very many institutional and office uses, high mows, student accommodation. It includes Hallam University, its campus, and we are close to the hospitals and Eccles Hall Road. It's, diver it's the diversity and the locational advantages that makes it an attractive place to live in. But nonetheless, it has associated problems. On-street car parking, rat running, noise and disturbance. Despite this over the years, efforts of the residents and the council have helped enhance the essential character of the area and reverse a steady decline. It's not that long ago since the whole area was a red light district. The progress made in changing properties back to residential use has had significant positive benefits for the community. The report is silent on this. More worryingly, both the officer and the applicant have accused residents and members of our association of nimbyism, 
and discrimination, she's actually stated that it's dangerous and concerning that objectors have assumed that future occupants, occupants at number 16 would not choose to integrate with the community. This is disingenuous and it's, it's, it's enraged us. It's simply a fact that the loss of C3 does undermine the cohesion of the residential community as recognised by your own policies. The report also states that the assessment of information provided the character of this building will be similar to that of a dwelling house. However, this relies on unconfirmed and very late information telephoned through to me by, the, by your officer. The process of information on the application has been really difficult. However, even if it proves to be quite domestic, the applicant could quite conceivably increase the number of residents without limitation at the moment. Importantly, and I can't overstate this point, with a C2 consent, the property could be sub subsequently sold on and occupied by a whole different range of uses from a rehabilitation centre, training centre, clinic, or any other C2 use. In conclusion, therefore, approval of this application will be contrary to planning policy, in our opinion. It will undermine the efforts of this council to restore the area to C3 use, which has brought significant benefits to our community uh, and its special character as a conservation area. We believe the application should be rejected. If you are minded to approve, we make a plea that you defer it to ensure robust conditions are attached which should restrict this permission to the applicants only, so, so later applica application will be needed if it's moved on, and that numbers of residents, car parking, and other controls are put in place. But we would please urge you to reject it, and we do have the support of our local Green councillor, Angela. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Cotton. If you'd like to turn your microphone off now, Thank you. Stuart, would you like to reply to those um, comments? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> um, I'll just attend to those in, 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 in the order of uh, kind of noting them down. Um, in terms of the officer's comment regarding uh, the balance uh, of residential versus non-residential uses. Um, and I don't know the, 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 the sphere of the, of the study that took place, um, but I, I, I'm confident it would have engaged in more than uh, the four properties that, that, that number 16 is uh, perhaps part of, um, and that it would feature the wider uh, range. Um, and, and as stated on page, beg your pardon, of the report um, and the inspection of the immediate vicinity demonstrates over 50% units remaining uh, residential use um, and we concluded that that isn't and, and, and advise that that isn't an over concentration on residential uses. Um, in terms of um, um, the concern that the, the, the applicant has committed you know, perhaps uh, a, large ex a large amount of finance to the property, so must have received some commitment from planning. Um, that's, that, that's not the case. Uh, we responded to that in the supplementary report as well. Um, and to back that up, um, no, no commitments were given at all. Um, um, and I think that's outlined in item number four of the supplementary report. Um, In terms of the concern of perhaps intensification or uh, uh, magnification of the number of residents, um, I think uh, it's safe to say that the property, um, the building itself, uh, sort of acts to limit the, uh, the the potential for that. Uh, the buildings of a you know certain size. There are no proposals to expand it, extend it currently as part of this application. Um, that acts to you know, limit the uh, amount of facilities that could be provided within. Um, any increase in, uh, in, in, in the size of the building would you know, need its own an individual planning permission, which would be assessed 
uh, on its own merits at a particular point that it may or may not be received. Um, so we, I think as officers we wouldn't necessarily feel the need to, to limit number of residents at this stage. And one of the later comments that was raised just now um, regarding perhaps possible conditions and limiting to applicants only, um, I, th I think that's also covered in the, uh, in the, the, the report at some length uh, and there was not felt uh, to be a reasonable justification to limit, um, um, uh, limit uh, uh, the current applicants um, uh, as isola in isolation to the other uses that are that, that, that's within the C2 planning use class classification. Um, in terms of car parking, um, it's, it's not thought that, that there'll be a danger to on-street parking. I think there'll be very little pressure for on-street parking generated by the proposal. Um, there's ample on-street and off-street facilities, hard standing, uh, uh, existing uh, within the property, as we've seen on the, some of the photographs, uh, to ensure that staff parking could be uh, consolidated together and they exist within the existing um, and take place within the existing facilities there. Um, I think I've covered the main items that were raised. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Stuart. I'll open it up for members' questions now. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Davison. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> the first one, if, if the, this were to be passed and um, Residents have expressed that uh, there would be a problem with, with the traffic, particularly the parking. Would there be a turning circle, or could that be a part of the conditions that a turning circle was um, uh, built into the um, into the roadway or, or part of the um, the driveway? over to Helen. Oh, thank you, thank Helen. you Chair. Um, yes, Chair, I think we will be, well, at the moment, as it stands, the, the, the car park isn't laid out formally. Um, there's an area of hard standing. I've actually had a look at this this morning, and in terms of getting standard car parking spaces in the area that's currently available, you can get in the order of eight spaces. That's 2.5 metres by 5 metres dimension spaces um, with appropriate aisle width for turning. I think you would be able to also uh, get a turning area to the, at the top of the site. Obviously, it wouldn't accommodate a refuse vehicle, but there again, a refuse vehicle wouldn't use that access anyway. But it would certainly be of a suitable size to accommodate something like a transit van um, that obviously may be, may be uh, requiring access. So. Um, although there isn't a formal layout, certainly the area of hard standing that's currently available um, would accommodate those man excuse me, manoeuvres. Um, and if it was acceptable, I would assume that we could put a condition on asking for the layout to be submitted. Thank you. Please, yes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, the other one concerns the, um, the C2... Uh, category. If this were to be passed and the, uh, the current owners sold it, would the next owners then have, if they wanted a nursing home for example, would they then have to seek uh, further planning permission? Stuart? Thank you Chair. Uh, no, any uh, um, um, uh, other C2 use would be uh, uh, possible within this permission. Right. So, in other words, it, it could be could be sold on, and it could be for any um, any organisation that comes within the the C two, which is the residences. Yes, that's correct. Any further questions, Councillor Little? Yes, thank you. Um, just want some clarification, really. Uh, I understand that. Uh, it's, the, it's being argued that this is a, a residential uh, property uh, and it's, it seems to be blurring the edges in some way. If we're talking about a residential institution, 
rather than a family home. And I think that that's a, that is a, a clear change of character of use within the area. Uh, and uh, that does concern me a great deal. I also would like to know why the, why the term dangerous and concerning was used in the document. Um, I mean, you know, any, this is an, an, a development that will be with people with learning disabilities and autism. Um, and I don't think in any way that it, does the local community express any concerns about that. And I think that the, this is, you know, it's, it's language that shouldn't have been used in here. Um, it seems to imply that anyone actually objecting to it is, is being sort of disrespectful or, you know, it just feels completely out of character of, what, of, a, of a, a professional report. Uh, so I'm very concerned about. I'm also concerned, uh, I'm a substitute member for this committee, um, also concerned that I haven't seen any report about uh, nice considerations, for example, for the uh, residential property for people with, with learning disabilities. We've had the Winterbourne scandal, uh, and I would want to know, are the number of people going to be employed there sufficiently trained, for example, I know this is, doesn't actually, is not particularly a... Bernard, so, is this a, a, a planning consideration? Well, I, I, want, I, would, I want to know, you know, if people with learning disabilities are in the area, I want to know that the staff and the, the, the institution has been looked at and approved by an outside body to say that this is something, you know, this is a great concern. Um, you know, there were dreadful things, there's dreadful things, and the training of staff Do is important. Do you ask a comment, please? Could you ask your question, please, rather than and comment? Ha, is, is there a report re available? I'll hand over to the officer now. Bernard, could you uh, turn your microphone off, please? Thank you. Stuart, do you want to take this? Or do you... Right, I'll hand over to Diana for this one. Thank you, Chair. I think with respect to the, to the, the NICE guidelines, um, they, that will be dealt with under separate legislation. This facility will need its own licences uh, in order to operate, and they will be um, judging those sort of those criteria. In the planning department, we are, we are considering the, planning, the material planning considerations, which are you know, the, the sort of the use, um, but not the, the detail in terms of the, um, the NICE guidelines. Um, Vicky, did you want to come in on this? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I know the member has commented on um, some content of the report. Um, can I suggest that I, I make some inquiries after the meeting and report back to the co-chairs about that wording? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So you have one question that you asked originally. Would you like to re-ask that question, please? Yes, it, the question concerns, I want clarification over whether this is a, a res, residential property or whether it's a residential institution. Thank you. Stuart, would you like to come in on that one? Yeah. Use Class C2 is a residential institution. Um, that's, that's the title of the use, use classification within the Planning Act. Um, um, we've obviously assessed the implications of that uh, and how that, how that would stand uh, and in terms of similarity or indifference to uh, um, use, uh, C3 uses, C3 dwelling house uses. And it's considered that there, there wouldn't be substantial differences between a C2 use and a, and a C3 use uh, and, um, uh, at all. But in terms of, is it a different use? Yes, C2 use is classified as a residential institution. That's in order for the planning system to, 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 to operate and to, you know, to, to have different uses, uh, uses in different boxes, as it were. Thank you. Thank you. I've also got an indication from Peter. Peter, was that a question you want? Comment, okay. Okay, uh, I'll pass on to Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
couple of quick questions uh, for the officers. Firstly, um, if you look on slide 12, um, there appears to be a separate building. Um, I went up and had a look at the site this morning. It is a big site. I mean, it's it's actually it's actually very big. But is that is that a standalone building in its own right, or is that part of the whole residential area? Stuart, would you like to pick that up? Yes, Chair. Thanks, Councillor. Um, I do apologise, Councillor. If we're talking about the green building, the grey building, the, 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 yeah, the, that's, the, a, that's the, the um, um, flat roofed extension which is referred to in the report. And sec secondly, um, if this changes to C2, does it drop out of our housing supply? Yeah, we're no longer at function as a C3 use. Is that okay, Richard? Yeah. Uh, I've got Councillor Peter Garbutt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm concerned that when changing from C3 to C2, there are other implications um, that we haven't touched on in this report. Um, I'm also a member of the Fire Authority, and yesterday we received some training on this. Um, in, uh, in buildings where there are communal areas, and I think C2 falls within that, category, um, the fire service need to be involved at planning stage. Uh, this is what I understood from my training yesterday. Uh, they also need to make sure that there is um, adequate uh, access uh, for a fire appliance and water nearby. Has any of that been done? And um, if so, why wasn't it in the report? Stuart, would you like to come in on this one? Thank you. Um, issues surrounding fire safety and so on will be covered uh, primarily under building regulations. Um, so it will be that legislation that will cover those issues. Is that it? Um, that that wasn't my understanding from the training I received yesterday. From the training I received yesterday, the, the, that's a planning uh, 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 question rather than building regs question. But how? defer to your greater knowledge if that's what you say. Um, that's, what, that's not what I understood from my training yesterday. Do I have any other indications or questions? No? Then I'll move on to comments. Peter, Councillor Price. Thanks, Chair. It's a pity that planning still use the term institutions when describing property because social services moved away from this a long time ago. And the whole aim of social services is to remove people from institutions and place them into small homes where they can integrate with the community. This is the third one we've had at planning where, where we've tried to integrate small units of disabled people within the estates where they can access to local shops, local bus services, and this is another, another stage of that. The policy is to integrate people with autism and learning difficulties where they, it, it's, it's it, semi-independent living, where they can live independent with a little help from officers in a home situation. And this is a, uh, this is a very large one, actually, but it, there's no more people in here than would be if it was a large residential with people living in there. It is a residential place for disabled people. Instead of parents, they have got staff assisting them in their living in their communities. I fully support the recommendation, Chair. I said this each time we've had these, and there's one on parts, in my own area, Smartson's Cross, which, which was five, I think, adults. And that was similar worries from the people around about. It's now people wouldn't realise any difference in the other house on the estate. And I think the same will apply here. I understand the fears when people talk about residential institutions, because remember the large ones and this people coming out all the time. This is very, very different, and I fully support what we're trying to do to give people with learning difficulty and autism a more, more part integration within our community where they can mix with their community and live normal, no, as normal lives as possible. Not many of them, I guess, will drive, so the, the, the suggestion that there will be a lot of cars, it, I think it, it's going over the top of it. So, Chair, I fully support the officer recommendation and hope members do also. Thank you, Councillor. No more comments? Vicky, would you like to come in at this point? 
Thank you, Chair. I uh, was just reflecting on, on some of the comments um, earlier, and I just wanted to remind members about the public sector equality duty and the um, responsibilities there for the authority to have due regard to um, those things that you'll be aware of from your training. If anybody wants me to run through that now, I'm happy to do that. Um, it's just in respect of this, we do have some um, public sector equality duty um, considerations here to have due regard for the need to advance the equality of opportunity between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not and to foster good relations between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not and this involves things such as having um, ideas of taking steps to meet the needs of people from protected groups where these are different from the needs of other people um, so if anyone wants to go into more detail I'm happy to do that thank you thank you Vicky Right, I now uh, move, propose to move to the vote. And I shall go around the room. The uh, recommendation is to grant conditionally. I'll go around the room and ask each member individually to state whether they're in favour of that or not. I'll start with you, Peter. Councillor Garb. Thank you, Chair. Um, with some reservations, I'm going to vote for this. Councillor Little. I will, will be uh, voting against this application. Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll be voting for the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Chris Walsing Josephs. For the application, Chair. Councillor Peter Price. For the recommendation, Chair. Councillor Bob McCann. For the office recommendation, Chair. Councillor Andy Sanger. Uh, for the officer's recommendation, Chair. Councillor Roger Davison. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have reservations, but I'm going to vote for it. Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, for the application, Chair. And Councillor Alan Woodcock. For the application, Chair. I make it that that is passed. Yep, OK. So that application is passed. Thank you very much for your time and your contributions. Thank you. Um, now, I'll remind people before we go on to the next application, um, which is on page... I'm gone, I've got so many pounds of paper here. Um, yeah. Application 7B, which is on page 27. Uh, those members that this is the deferred item uh, for 322 Abbeydale Road at Coles Corner. Those members who were not here to participate in the full debate on the last um, and the last planning meeting um, can take no part in this debate nor in the voting. So, um, as with officers, when their contribution is is over, um, if you have other business to attend to and you would like to leave the meeting, please do so. Thank you very much. Right, I'll hand over to the officers to present the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members will recall that the application was previously presented to committee, as we've just been hearing, on 1st of March and was deferred uh, in order to enable consideration to be given um, and by officers uh, to implications of allowing music to be played uh, through loudspeakers in the internal shelter uh, and whether this was feasible with appropriate controls. Um, discussions have taken place involving um, planning officers, uh, environmental protection officer um, and business Sheffield representatives um, and a councillor as well uh, that's taken place um, in, in terms of the conclusions of that um, 
with my colleague Dominic Stokes here today uh, from Environmental Protection, um, who will be able to answer any specialist questions. But very much just to kind of wrap up uh, the conclusion of those discussions, as you'll have seen uh, outlined within the report. The conclusions were that it was not considered possible to uh, um, um, organize uh, or, 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 or provide a condition um, uh, that could have been uh, that could have that could have achieved what members previously uh, um, uh, tasked t tasked officers with with seeking uh, uh, around that um, so that hasn't that you'll see that, that hasn't been included in the report it continues to be recommended that no music is played um, uh, or no loudspeakers uh, uh, operate um, uh, within the extension or directed to broadcast sound inside the extension any time and that remains as, as condition four. Um, if you can just briefly please move through the photographs just to give a perhaps a refreshment uh, of where we were. So yeah. That's the property there, outlined in red, as we know, at the end of that terrace of six properties. If we just focus on that for a moment, if you may go back one slide, please, apologies. Um, there's a property that's mentioned in the, in the report, in the relevant section of the report, um, um, that, that, that's, that's on the opposite side of the road and just to the south, so it's about 50 yards away. So that's at the junction of Abbeydale Road and Hale Street, that you can see on the, prop, on the plan there. Um, previously operated as starlight, uh, starlight kitchen, bedroom, uh, furniture uh, outlet, um, if people are familiar with the area and if that helps locate it in, on the ground there. Uh, that's the location of the property that's, that was covered and, and, and talked through in the, in the officer report. Uh, the reason why that was focused upon was because the, uh, the the discussions around the application site at 322 um, um, were able to uh, borrow, as it were, from the research and the noise surveys and uh, um, uh, uh, conclusions that were drawn about the noise uh, affecting the bar and uh, playing of music at the, 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 the neighbouring site. Um, um, it was considered, and the conclusion was was arrived at that it was impossible to come to a, con a condition applying that may have to be applied to number 322 that would that would achieve music that was uh, audible and that was above background levels without resulting in a disturbance um, uh, um, um, to neighbours and so on and so forth and again if you can just move through photos thank you and apologies um, Perhaps to slide 18, thank you. So again, just by way of refreshment, that's the structure that we're concerned with. Um, um, and if we move to 19, so we can see the, the timber slats, uh, the, the clear plastic sheeting and the corrugated plastic roofing. Um, uh, the three, three, Planting boxes are located on the public footpath. Um, just next photo, please. Thank you. So that's from Abbeydale Road itself. You can see the, 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 the double door, the different door from the pre preceding photograph. Uh, next photo, please. Thank you. Again, a different angle on that same, same photograph, seeing with the context of the existing frontage a little more clearly. Um, next photograph, please. Next photograph, please. Thank you. That's the structure in its uh, original form. And then uh, next, I think, last photograph, please. Thank you. And then that's just the front elevation of the property. Um, again, with, with the plastic sheet and tarpaulin uh, above, uh, showing on the front elevation. So in terms of the, the officer recommendation, um, um, we see that there's a, there's a need for, for uh, structures and they've been uh, allowed through the pandemic to provide um, heating facilities and so on with extra external space 
um, and there are a number of them, uh, a good number of them along uh, Abidal Road in this portion uh, as well. Um, we recently entered an initiative with local businesses to see a way forward for that. Obviously, as the pandemic thankfully draws to a close, uh, looking to uh, uh, work through on the structures and, 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 and help businesses uh, uh, move towards acceptable structures. That's a recent initiative that, that we're in, uh, part way through right at the moment um, in terms of uh, trying to take things forward. We appreciate that you know it's been a, an extremely difficult time for businesses such as hospitality uh, businesses. Um, and, and therefore, whilst we're concerned about the, the physical appearance of the, uh, of the addition, um, in order to, to facilitate navigating through the complexities of the, of the process that, that, that we've just touched upon, um, the 18-month recommendation is there as a temporary consent in order to allow consideration to be given to um, 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 perhaps more substantial, uh, more long-term, more permanent structure and so on that may... Uh, that, 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 that would be more acceptable in visual terms and would uh, deal with the relevant policies uh, locally, nationally uh, speaking. Um, so that could be, uh, you know, we could get to a position where a, 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 an appropriate structure is, is proposed and we feel that the 18 month period is adequate in order to allow that to be a focused exercise without becoming um, um, you know, rushed or, or, or too, too hastily uh, entered into. Um, and as I mentioned uh, earlier in my introduction, uh, Dominic will be able to answer any questions surrounding the specific technicalities uh, of, of the noise um, assessment that I've, that I've briefly covered. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Stuart. Dominic, do you want to come at this stage or would you like to answer, uh, do you have anything to say at this stage to contribute to the report? Or would you like to come in to answer specific questions later? Um, I'll just come in and answer any questions anyone's got, really. I think Stuart covered it quite well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Right, now we have two speakers um, in favour of this application. Um, the first speaker is Nicole Jewett. Nicole, if you'd like to come forward to the desk, please. Um, Given that um, we have slightly different emphasis on this report, we know you've spoken before, but it's only fair to allow you to have your five minutes again. So the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I've uh, given you all a copy of a few more photos to look at. Uh, the sketch you can see on the handout was my vision for a socially distanced terrace seating area back in 2020. The following photo was the structure that we erected in June 2020 in line with what we understood to be the government's guidelines um, to allow businesses like ourselves to reopen safely in the pandemic. The planters filled with climbing plants served as attractive but effective dividers between the booths and COVID restrictions coupled with the sweltering heat meant that these booths were extremely popular in the summer of 2020. Thanks to the decor plants and importantly the background music we were able to create an environment with all safety measures in place, but while still being a nice, relaxing place to sit, people often would tell us that they felt like they were on holiday while sat in our little terrace. By winter 2020, with hospitality back in lockdown, the terrace enabled us to create a Christmas market feel, serving hot dogs and not dogs and mulled cider from the terrace with background music playing, whilst allowing a maximum of four people at any one time to shop our range of vinyl records plus local arts, crafts, honey, hot sauces and more. We created a little bit of outdoor, socially distanced, festive fun despite the virus and despite the restrictions. Many people thanked us for this, including several of our nearest neighbours who said we were a lifeline for them during an otherwise incredibly isolating period. Fast forward to May 2021, just as some of the restrictions were being eased, we received an email from the planning department requesting that we apply for retrospective planning permission within the next 28 days. We explained that the seating area, our COVID shelter as, as we saw it, um, didn't require planning and that because the cafe and shop classes were now all under class E, we also didn't believe that we needed a change of use. 
but the planning officer insisted that we did. So we got to work doing the drawings and submitting the application and paying the £462 fee. We heard nothing further until after August 2021, just after the Sheffield Music Trail event, which unfortunately for us, uh, received some negative feedback from some neighbours who'd forgotten that we were having the event. They also took their grievances to our planning application, unfortunately, and left their comments there. We received one visit from the Environmental Health uh, Department in August 2021, and they confirmed that we had complied with all regulations as we were operating under a temporary events notice on the day of the Sheffield Music Trail. One of the neighbours followed up with a further complaint on a subsequent Friday afternoon, but when asked to document dates and times of any disturbances going forward, nothing further was heard from them, as confirmed by Environmental Protection Services. We've since worked extremely hard to build good relationships with all of our neighbours, and we stay in regular communication with them to ensure that we're not causing a disturbance. They told us the modifications we've made more recently with the doors at either end have afforded them much more privacy and keep the sounds to a minimum. More recently, the closest neighbour tells us that they're often unaware whether we're open or not. And the, the other neighbour who had complained after the music event now tells us that they feel much safer for us being in the area. Furthermore, we were involved in this year's music trail just the Saturday before last. The event was very well attended and we've had no complaints or issues further to that. We've listened to the concerns from EPS and planning and we've investigated how we might enable the incidental or background music, as we would call it, to be monitored. So we recently purchased a decibel reader, as per the photo on the handout, um, and we've been operating within the COVID government guidelines, which were made legislation in September 2021, uh, of not exceeding 85 decibels. We found that with the music at this level, it's ba barely audible from the nearest neighbouring properties, which are situated around 30 feet from us. At the last hearing, the committee members deferred the decision to allow for further consideration of the amendment to condition six, which would allow music to be played externally within the structure at an acceptable level rather than the blanket ban proposed. We ask that this blanket ban, blan, ban be replaced with music only being permitted between 11 a.m. and 9 p.m. and no louder than 85 decibels at source, which we can monitor with the sound level that we've brought. Um, this would be constantly in the view of our CCTV camera, which we keep a record of um, for one month, so we would be able to provide the, the levels at any time within 28 days if there were a complaint. Furthermore, having reviewed the live stream of the debate, we feel that there was enough support in the room to allow for the structure to remain for more than 18 months, and um, we would ask that this be looked at as well. We are one of many businesses hanging on by a thread in these extremely difficult times, with new and extra challenges arising every day. With this in mind, we ask that the committee extend the temporary period to 36 months to allow us sufficient time to make the business work and find a way for us to be allowed to play music at least until 9pm. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Nicole. The second speaker I have is Councillor Paul Turpin. Paul, if you'd like to come up to the... Um, the microphone, make yourself comfortable and the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me to come and speak here. <coughs> I really appreciate that. So um, I'm here on, in, um, in my role as Executive Member for Inclusive Economy, Jobs and Skills and uh, looking after and working with small local businesses. Uh, Sheffield is a city of small local business. Around 85% of Sheffield businesses have fewer than 10 employees. They are the lifeblood of the local economy. Local businesses benefit the local economy more than out-of-town nationals and multinationals, and we, as a council, must do everything we can to support them and help them to thrive. Our local businesses are fighting for their lives right now, with the perfect storm of the cost of living crisis, Brexit and Covid making life more difficult than ever. This is the worst time to be putting extra pressures on them. The section of Abbeydale Road, where Coles Corner is, has a vibrant, independent retail and hospitality culture, but it is by no means typical of Sheffield. Small business owners put their personalities and their souls into their businesses. They are much more than just a shop or just a bar. They are an extension of that person who runs and owns them. They display innovation and creativity to find their place in the market, and this is their superpower. 
It is what makes them stand out from the chains. A vibrant, independent business quarter is exactly what attracts people there, benefiting all the businesses holistically, not just one or another. Building a network of cooperation and collaboration, together they are stronger. Abidale Road is one of these places in Sheffield that has managed to harness the energy and diversity of a community that creates an overall offer which appeals to the public. This council has developed a new way of working with business and, and other communities during lockdown, creating a network of collaboration that mutually benefits them and us. However, it seems like some people are falling back into the old ways of them and us. The contradictory element of this planning application is that the outdoor seating area at Coles Corner was funded by money received from us, the council. The speaker used for background music was funded by money received from us. The event that generated the complaints about noise was an event funded by us. What the council gives in one hand, the council is now trying to take away with the other. The sound levels issued during the pandemic were such that voices didn't need to be raised in order to prevent spreading the virus. Surely this is a suitable level still that won't cause undue noise pollution for neighbours. In other cities, Manchester, Leeds and Nottingham, there is a vibrant cafe bar pavement culture where the local authority backs their local businesses to help them thrive. Why should the same type of business in Sheffield be competing with the local authority? As I've said, small local businesses are extensions of the business owners themselves. This is what makes them unique and special. More than just a business, they exude individuality. They resist the homogeneity we see too often on the high street, adding culture and an advert to other small local businesses that they can succeed at, that independent thoughts and innovation creates a terrain where local businesses can flourish. The structure at Coles Corner stands out as a quirky, trendy seating area and is perfectly fitting in this environment. Outdoor seating was a lifeline for local businesses during the pandemic, and it's not over yet. With cases still high, lots of people are anxious about being outdoors with other people, um, about being indoors, sorry, with other people, but can meet up and socialize outdoors more readily, supporting the local business and helping to improve their own well-being by having a social life. I've been told by people in the planning department that every case is taken on its merits, but I am doubting this. All 24 hospitality venues on this stretch of Abbeydale Road have been issued with the same demand. This is a systemic approach making life harder than it needs to be. I've spoken to the head of planning and the appropriate directors and there is an appetite there to build a policy with the business team and the regulatory departments, licensing, planning, highways, environmental protection for Sheffield about how the council interacts with local business. But that work hasn't yet been done. I hope that we'll, we will get to a point where cases like this one are avoided and that whenever the council and businesses come together, it's in a supportive and collaborative way. I ask the members of the committee to back Coles Corner, reject the music ban and leave the outdoor seating structure to remain. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Turpin. I will hand over to officers now to see if they want to make any comments on those representations. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just pick up on the, the comments regarding um, um, enabling the, the, the extension to remain for 36 months or potentially um, um, permanently. Um, just really reflect upon what I said in the introductory uh, comments uh, and uh, refer back to the uh, planning officer report as well. The structure in its current state uh, wouldn't be considered to be uh, acceptable by officers um, um, as a permanent structure. Um, the concession to, uh, uh, to allow the, short, uh, the shorter period of 18 months um, uh, as a limit to, to, its, uh, to, its, uh, to its remaining uh, there on, on site is in, is in order to allow um, just some thought and some, uh, some discussions to take place around what may uh, be considered to be uh, more acceptable, uh, more policy compliant uh, and, 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 and more conducive to, 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 to the way we, we feel things ought, ought to be proposed there. Um, so that perhaps tends to 
the, 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 the suggestion that perhaps 18 months uh, is a too short a period or there shouldn't be a limit upon upon that that that, that length of time um, in terms of the um, um, the letters that, that have been sent out from planning to um, 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 the hospitality venues and, and, and those with uh, temporary structures and so on uh, mentioned by councillor turpin um, i think we sent out a, num a number a couple of letters uh, to, to, to neighbors i think to neighbors to, to, to neighboring businesses um, and i think the first was uh, um, 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 not written as well as it might have been i think we acknowledge that in the second letter uh, where we, we apologize for for, for uh, perhaps the tone the turn of phrase um, and, 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 and you know set out our uh, determination to work in, uh, in, in collaboratively and in that way uh, of, you know in, in a supportive way to help um, um, businesses that perhaps find this um, um, a new experience um, 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 complicated um, um, confusing um, um, to navigate through uh, that process um, so that's the, uh, the intention the, the, the recently issued letter uh, I believe uh, is, is, is hopefully going to take things forward from that point of view. Um, perhaps I'll pass over to Dominic for more specific comments regarding the noise uh, issues. Thank you. Um, hi there. Um, so my name is Dominic Stokes. I work for the Environmental Protection Ser Service. Just to give you some context, um, we uh, look after um, deal with noise from commercial premises in terms of licensing. Um, public nuisance, uh, statutory nuisance in, under the Environmental Protection Act. And we also act as consultees for the uh, planning service. Um, so just coming to this particular uh, issue, um, I mean, it's our, our general experience that, that speakers uh, in external areas um, aren't a great idea just in terms of amenity and or nuisance. Um, and across the city, we tend to insist that um, no music is played through outdoor speakers. Uh, so this, this generally applies to nearly everywhere on Eccleville Road and Abbeydale Road. Um, so just down the road from, this, from Coles Corner, we've got two thirds and the teller, and they both have conditions attached to them that no loud speakers should be fixed externally. Um, just, just to give you some context there, that we had a recent complaint about speakers erected outside the two-thirds, um, which were contrary to the, the, to the planning. So that gives us some confidence that um, um, our recommended conditions are generally quite effective. Um, the um, background noise level survey referred to in the report was at 337. Uh, starlight and I think it's about 50 meters away I think um, we could probably use that data to just inform us about what kind of level the background levels are at um, so the report referred to uh, I think they were the background levels are between 39 and, and 52 dBA on a Friday and Saturday uh, I've looked at the report itself um, and just looking at the proposed times here the, the, the levels fluctuate throughout the day, as you might expect, um, generally dominated by traffic noise. Uh, they're probably at a maximum during the afternoon period. Um, and just the proposed hours here, they fall off between about 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock at night. And we're getting between 47 and 44 dB, 44 dB being the lowest, probably just before 9 at 9 p.m. Um, we do have concerns about the structure of the premises. Um, I mean, it's, uh, um, it doesn't offer little to no resistance to the passage of sound. Um, we've got a polycarbonate roof there. We've got plastic sheeting. If you sit in there, uh, I went there on Saturday myself, there's massive gaps uh, in the structure. Um, and if you don't know, in terms of acoustics, uh, the weakest point really defines the performance of the structure. So. Um, it may as well not be there, if I'm honest. Um, to be fair to the applicant, uh, when I went there, it, it was very low, the background music. Um, however, I did have a little walk around South Croft Gardens, um, 
and you can still hear it. So it does give us cause for concern that you know it, it could be a potential problem were it to be allowed. Um, what really needs to happen is there needs to be some work done on the structure before speakers could be allowed in there. So um, introduce some mass there, get rid of all the air gaps, uh, you know, proper windows, proper doors, that kind of thing. That's the way you control noise transmission from one premises to another. Um, we haven't received many complaints, that's true to say. Um, uh, we had a couple associated with the music trail last year. Um, we haven't had any this year. If we did a similar thing, I'm not sure whether we did or not um, last week. So um, I think the noise is being controlled. However, our role really is to, to, to make sure that the premises is suitable and offers enough protection for residents for, and, and not particularly to rely on management controls uh, solely, which I think we would be doing in this case. Um, 85 dB, I'm not quite sure what kind of sound level you, you were using there. Um, certainly the music that I was listening to on Saturday wasn't anywhere near 85 dB. Um, voice talking, this kind of level is around about 60 odd de decibels. Uh, the strange thing about acoustics is um, ev every 3 dB doubles the kind of sound power. Just to give you an idea, a doubling in terms of how a human perceives it is about, about 10 decibels. Um, so 85 dB in that location, I don't believe you are playing it anywhere near that. Um, but if that were to be the limit, I think we could have serious problems going forward. Um, my colleague John Round, who, who wrote most of the, the, the report there, uh, in terms of our input at least, um, has got real concerns about setting levels given the, the fluctuating, na fluctuating nature of the background noise. Um, and the conclusion of, of the acoustic consultant that did the report for Starlight down the road was that really it's not possible to have speakers outside. Um, you know, we, you need a proper structure there to have any confidence whatsoever that you're going to be able to control the noise sufficiently. So um, I think probably that's it, unless anyone's got any questions for me. I, I realise a lot of it's a little bit technical um, around decibels, etc. But um, we don't generally um, allow speakers outside and to all intents and purposes, the structure is so flimsy with so many gaps in it, it, it may as well be outside. Thank you very much for that. I'll open the, it up to members' questions now. Um, the first indication I've got is from Councillor Davison. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, on uh, condition number four, it said no loudspeakers will be fixed within or externally. You've only talked about the external one. Why can't they have um, uh, a speaker fixed internally? And uh, does that mean that... Uh, if they have a, a record player, that's, that, that actually constitutes a loudspeaker. And if they were playing records to, um, uh, to people that came into the shop, would that, uh, would that break the condition? Dominic, would you like to come in? I'm not quite sure I follow you. If, if you're going to play records, they would, have to be, they would have to go through an amplifier and a speaker for people to hear them. Yes, so but that, <clears throat> that could be played internally, that's what I'm saying. It the shop. Sorry? It doesn't have to be heard outside. Yeah, uh, my understanding about this application is they, they want to play the music in the temporary structure. Um, yeah, but it, it does say here, fixed within or externally. It's got both in. I think, I think it covers uh, within the temporary structure or if they were to attach it to the outside of the temporary structure, I think. It's correct? not clear. It's, that, that, that sentence isn't clear to me. It sounded as if it, it, it included the internal uh, structure as well. Anyway. Well, we, mean, we do need clarification on that, so. Pardon? Oh, sorry, yes. Sir. 
So perhaps I can ask the question in a different way. Is the um, condition for the speaker relating to the inside or the outside of the temporary structure rather than inside the shop premises? Is that okay, Roger? Uh, the second question relates with the time period. I know all these things are going to be very difficult and uh, we tend to put arbitrary dates on things. If, if as the uh, proprietor says, three years is, uh, would be uh, a suitable limit to get them going uh, and, and 18 months that they couldn't, if they were to build a, a substantial structure, they couldn't get a payback uh, within that time. Um, would, it, uh, would it offend uh, planning um, officers if it were extended to, uh, to 36 months? Stuart, would you like to come in there? Thank you, Chair. Um, is extending one and a half years to three years? Uh, um, I don't think so. I don't think it would be you know, grossly offensive to, 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 to officers. Obviously, what it does do is it takes the focus off uh, um, working on a, on, a, on, a, on a revision that may be acceptable. And instead of um, um, setting to work on the proposal, um, if not the physical works, but setting to work on uh, um, you know, preparing ideas, thinking about designs, uh, liaising with officers and so on and so forth, that perhaps gets pushed down the road instead of becoming a, you know, a, a, perhaps a, 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 a short-term priority. Um, and then obviously leaving the, the, the extension in place for, for perhaps up to three years. That has the impact of um, um, perhaps detracting from the efforts to, to uh, address some of the other structures that are felt to be unacceptable along as well. So there's, there's, that, there's that issue to think about in terms of answering the question also. Um, does it take the focus off addressing those uh, perhaps unsightly items also? Thank you. Is that it, Roger? Okay. Uh, Councillor Sanger. Th 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 thanks, Chair. And it's, it's sort of struggling to remember where we were before we deferred this. Um, but uh, but I, mean, I mean, the starting point is that hospitality trade has had a really t difficult time in terms of in, t in terms of in terms of the pandemic and everybody struggled and and yet businesses that survive we need to find ways of ways of keeping them going um so so, so just just to try to understand where we are in terms of both in terms of the the music conditions so um so, so no ex external speakers and external includes in, in, includes this particular e extension but yeah, you know, we've we've heard about the, the the music trail, and we've heard clearly other other venues have are involved in that. And there's there's tram lines, and there's other events. So surely there must be exceptions to where we want music, because um, there are times when music can add. Is it not the case that music can add to the vibrancy of the scene? And you know, there's there's, there's times when we we would want more music than than just the background car noise. Dominic, would you like to answer that? Yeah, um, absolutely. For, for, for events like tram lines, we do, um, we do relax the rules. But it is three or four days, isn't it? Whereas if you, if you live next to Coles Corner, perhaps, uh, it could be most evenings every weekend, which is, which is a different consideration. But so, so you're saying you're not against um, having a condition that would allow you some music a certain number of days a year. It's just that that, um, yeah. and what sort of number of days would you say so, would so, the limit be? So, so there's provision in the licensing act for temporary event notices that people can apply for to extend hours and have certain events and we would look at those and deal with them in their own right with merits. So um, yeah, I mean that, that's provided for, but I think we're considering something different here, which would be to actually change the circumstances permanently on which the business operates rather than it being a series of temporary events. 
Diana, you wanted to come in here? We do have, we have, in, we have imposed conditions in the past where it does allow a small number of, of days. Um, well, you know, while there is a, a, a sort of blanket restriction on having outdoor speakers, we have identified a small number of days annually where people could hold an event externally. Um, so we could actually adapt a condition to, to allow that. Well, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, just to clarify, I was, uh, that's, I'm, I'm relying on the licensing legislation there rather than perhaps the planning legislation for that temporary event notice here. Okay, but the, the option for us as, as planning members is, is a planning condition on that line as well. Um, but can I, can I just pursue this, go back to the issue about the, about, to move back from Mr. Stewart's presentation about the, um, about the structure and the ad hoc nature and really asked the same question <laughs> six weeks ago. So what would you like to see the extension made of, it, it, the permanent one, whether, whatever number of months it, it is, but you, you, you consider the current structure to be temporary. Um, and that's not just for noise conditions, it's to be to, that the report is talking about how it fits in with the rest of the road. So, so what sort of structure would you find acceptable? Stuart, would you like to come in? Chair, um, this is by no means prescriptive. Um, um, it's a helpful question. Um, I think something that had a degree of permanency to it, um, um, perhaps higher quality materials, uh, um, less sort of ad hoc, um, something that was um, 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 more coordinated. Um, perhaps uh, a fewer number of materials, um, brush steel, maybe fully glazed elements. Um, um, obviously, this all then wraps into the noise insulating capabilities of, of the structure. So that design would be uh, so the design would be wise to factor in, um, 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 enabling it to, 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 to attend to some of the noise concern as well. Um, but yeah, as I say, not prescriptive, but just to give a flavour of, of what perhaps uh, um, may work there, that kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Jim. Peter. Uh, can I just get into this noise issue with the environmental health? You did say, or it did say that the traffic noise is up until seven or eight is much higher than the music. Therefore, the other thing, do, do we make any differentiation between the types of noise, which a traffic or noise is act, exactly the same as music or a steam hammer going? It seems to me there's a different annoyance in the types of noise the public listen to. And if it's a thundering lorry going past every two minutes, it's very different from music coming out of somebody's wet bedroom window. And I just wondered whether there is any way in environmental health who, do, who measure this sort of thing or the annoyance that it, it, it plays on, on the public. Plus the fact, if, if the noise of traffic is above that, we say that, between seven and eight at night, is that not a reason why you could allow music up until that sort of time um, that the traffic begins to quieten down? A bit complicated, but it just seems to me we put silly rules in on a place which is a music centre in, in many effect. Dominic, would you like to come in on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you're quite right. The character of the noise is very important, and certain types of noise are found by studies to be more irritating than others. Um, so people are less bothered by traffic noise, train noise, transportation type noise than they are than they are by, for example, music. So the frequency is quite important of, uh, of the noise under consideration, um, and your ear is more sensitive to certain frequencies than others. Um, so around about one kilohertz to four kilohertz, if your hearing is very sensitive to it. Um, different frequencies of noise um, have uh, go, travel further than others. So, so if it's very bassy, um, that's going to bother people more. So, so all those factors are taken into account. I think you're quite quite right to say that. Um, so if you lived in South Croft Gardens, you would have the rumble of the traffic on Abbeydale Road, but I think if, if, if we're playing music at 85 dB, that, that would stand out from that just because of its character and the frequency content of it. 
Does that answer your question? Pete, will you put your speaker on? We can't hear. Sorry, I, I, I should have said. I, 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 I differ in the fact that I much sooner listen to music coming out of somebody yeah. than traffic roaring past all the time. And um, if if the traffic is intended, the decibel level, it's it's a subjective thing to say one's more annoying than the other. Kind of. But the decibel level is a, a thing you can measure. So if at a certain time of the day the decibel level is whatever it is, at seven or eight o'clock then whatever makes that noise in that decibel level should be allowed, surely. Well, as I said before, the, the frequency content of the noise under consideration is, is very important too. But, but just taking that point, we've, we've got background levels of about 47 decibels between about 6 and, um, six and 9 o'clock at night. Um, so, so if we were to play music at 85 dB, for example, we'd be well above that, and it, and it would be really obvious. And, and I, I mean, I, I accept it's a personal choice that you prefer to listen to music than to traffic noise. That's... Is that okay, Pete? The only other thing is, you'd have to be in, indoors to, to be annoyed with it. Outdoors, you would you? I mean, it, it, we're worried about the noise affecting the houses that's behind. So you'd have to measure it from inside that house, right? Possibly. You could measure it outside, and, and a partially open window gives you about 15 dB of attenuation. So you can measure it outside and knock 15 dB off it. Okay. Um, I've now got uh, Bernard. Councillor Little. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really sort of reiterating in a way uh, what Councillor Price has just said about uh, decibel levels of uh, traffic. We seem to acclimatise to a, a level that I believe it's about 80 decibels sort of on average throughout the day, which is much higher than the, uh, you know, 70 at very most that uh, is being, we've been told that comes from the speakers of this, you know, from the, this record shop. I just, I just fail to understand why one is ex the traffic noise traffic is is, is accept is deemed as acceptable when actually we, most of us just don't have a choice from it. We can't get away from it. It drives us absolutely mad. Uh, you know, we've got to put up with it, and yet we're trying to sort of stop a, a music venue uh, broadcasting sound that you know allows people who are in there to actually speak to each other. It's not oppressive. Um, it's, it adds to the vibrancy of the street and the, uh, and, and the area. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I just can't understand why one sort of sound should be considered uh, more damaging than another sort of you know, sound. Well, noise, which I would say traffic is noise rather than and sound from music is sound because it's controlled and it's there for an actual, it, it generates a sort of resonance in us as human beings to music. I can't see why there should be any, one should be seen as worse than other, the other. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure where you're getting your figures from for traffic noise. Um, looking at this graph in front of me here, we're between about 48 and 59 decibels for the, for the noise from the traffic in a, in a, a, a similar location. Well, I, sorry, I may misunderstand this, but the last presentation we had, I was told, we were told that the decibel level from the, the street was actually higher on many occasions than the, the, the music coming from the venue. Yeah, I think that's why we deferred this to bring proper information on the um, on the noise levels. I will pass across to the officer. Yeah, I mean uh, we've got a survey here over three days, and and the, the what they call the LAEQ, which is the continuous equivalent sound level, it's between taken at a similar location because it matters where you take the measurement. If you stood right next to the road, for example, it's going to be a lot louder. If then you would be if you were stood 
way back on South Cross Gardens, obviously. Um, but we've got a level there of between, from Friday and Saturday, 48 and 58 decibels, and on Sunday, 48 to 56. So if you looked at a midpoint of that, you're looking around about 50 odd decibels, 55 dB, something like that, uh, is a contribution from the traffic noise. Um, so, so the, the reality of that is that if you were playing through a speaker at 85 decibels, again, depending on where you measure it, one metre from the speaker, for example, uh, given the structure that is, I, I think that would be clearly audible above the traffic noise. Uh, Chair, I, 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 don't, I understand that 85 decibels is, is rarely going to be reached. That, that, isn't, that was not the evidence provided by the, the applicant. The applicant was saying that they were, they were keeping you know, below 70, basically. So, and, and as you were saying, that it's a sort of a, a, uh, the curve of the way the, the decibels are measured goes up quite steeply. Actually, you know, a, a, um, 70 decibels is quite reasonable. Is there a question in here, Councillor? Well, I'm, I'm, question, I'm again questioning why, why we're no, talking about... You're questioning, about, but are you yeah. asking a question? Why, why, is the quest, why are we assuming from, from, the, from um, environmental health that the level of noise, it, the, the level of sound coming out of the speakers is... is uh, 85 decibels well that's a maximum uh, you know and that uh, that's probably what the speakers are capable of in you know the, the, we've been made absolutely clear that that is not that is not normal at all and that they would accept that councillor you're making a speech we're asking questions yeah. thank you five is because the the applicant mentioned that particular um number as a, an appropriate level to set the speakers at. I'm just responding to that, really. Uh, yeah, um, I, I just heard what you said. Um, it didn't relate to amenity or nuisance. That was very much inside of premises work to stop people singing um, or, or shouting to try and, well, it was when you got a rule of six, wasn't it? And um, you didn't want, singing was banned, but you didn't want people shouting at each other and spreading the virus. So it, it, it wasn't really related to environmental type noise and nuisance. I, I don't think you could rely on that as a standard. It was a temporary measure to stop disease. Does that answer your question, Councillor? So that answer, well, that addresses that question. Thank you. Um, my other question is, I, I need some guidance, please, on how to, how to vote on this, because I am in favour of allowing the venue to go for 36 months uh, before the structure is, is revised. Uh, does that, is that, will we be able to vote for that option? The reason why I'm saying that is that... Councillor, if you're making a proposition, if you're making a... a, a proposal to, to change the, uh, a recommendation to change the conditions, then you must propose that and I'll have it seconded, but I have a, another speaker that um, wants to come in before that, so you can have, you can think about that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I'm so... Thank you, Chair. Um, quite frankly, if anybody listens to this, who's as confused as I am. You know, if you make any sense out of what's being said, I'll be very surprised. But if I start, if I try and understand the sound thing, is that um, there's one part of it is decibels, the other part of it is frequencies. And traffic noise, in my understanding, is a low frequency sound, whereas music is a high frequency sound. Would that be correct? Dominic? Um, it, it would, well, the, fre the frequency profile of traffic would very much depend on the makeup of the traffic in question. So it's not, I'm sorry to be even more confusing. Uh, the, mu the music noise um, depends on the type of music. You know, you know you start, if, you, if you play classical music, it's very different to very bassy music, dance music, for example, which would travel a lot further. So it very much depends on the type of music that you're playing as to the, as to the con 
whether you can control it or not. So, my understanding from what the uh, applicant said, if I've understood it correctly, they no longer play music outside the premises, is that correct? It's now inside the premises. So therefore, the music is not going to travel as far. And contrary to what Peter Council Price says, if you are sat listening to Coronation Street and there's a lot of music playing outside, you know, you're not going to enjoy Coronation Street quite so much. So it is an issue, the, the, the decibel level, but um, my understanding of, mu of the music levels is that the frequency travels more, or is more penetrative, should I say, than general traffic noise outside. Yes, yeah, stud studies have shown that, that, that music noise does tend to irritate people more than more constant types of noise like traffic noise, etc. Uh, what I would say is that the, the music is being played inside the temporary structure. But, but my argument really was that that's not really affording any resistance to the passage of sound from there to the houses. So it may as well be being played outside. So if we come back to the structure, I mean, it is very obviously a very temporary structure. And the officer recommendation is 18 month period for this to be sort of decided upon and, and either replaced or failed application or whatever. But the thing that bothered me and people have said about 36 months, the thing I would say is, I mean, I've been in business myself and I know how fragile business can be. And not the best one in the world this may not survive, which means that the applicant as now will no longer be in place, but somebody else can take over that property and decide, well, this is what it is, I'm going to keep it, and you go back to all this thing again. So as far as I'm concerned, Chair, I think that we need to stick to 18 months because it's only fair on the rest of the people on every Abidale Road, Tecklesaw Road, etc., where most of the venues are, that they have to comply with regulations, so I'm sorry to the applicant, but they have to comply with regulations, as everybody else does. So, um, Thank you, Councillor. Um, I've got Roger indicating. Did you have a, an additional question, Roger? Well, I, I, I was going to say about uh, uh, having an amendment uh, to, to this. Um, the, the, other, the other thing that we could um, argue about is whether, if, it were to, if we were to say 18 months, but they could reapply in 18 months for a further extension of 18 months, would that be an acceptable way of going about it? Stuart? That's certainly an option. We would uh, you know, evaluate that application, that the 18 month period, uh, time period. Um, Certainly, an option that an application could be submitted to vary that condition. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got Councillor Little indicating. Is there anybody that's not spoken for the first time that would want to speak before I start bringing people in for back, second bites of the cherry? No, nope. Councillor Little. Yes, I could see clarification. If the venue isn't allowed to play music bearing in mind that it's a record shop, does that mean that the business... Have you had any indication from the applicant that should that be the case, that they can't be playing music outside, that the shop will can, can continue to be in business? Stuart, would you like to respond to that? In terms of the shop being able to play music, I think we... Um, identified early uh, in the discussion is that music within the shop uh, that, that, that's that's quite quite permissible and not the focus of our thoughts discussions this afternoon um, so it doesn't the, none of this discussion would would stop music being played within the four walls as it were of the shop thank you uh, I mean, my question was about music being played outside. If music was being broadcast outside, has the applicant uh, indicated whether that would actually stop their bit, make their business unviable? Councillor, I don't think we can have an opinion on that because that is not a planning consideration. Vicky? 
thank you, Chair. Um, uh, that's right. Um, it's, it's not about um, that in that respect. So the business already plays music within the venue, uh, and this is the temporary structure. Um, so the business was already viable, and the temporary structure was erected in respect of COVID. Um, so it, it isn't relevant here. Final girl, Bernard. Yeah. Then I'm going to yeah. pass it across to comments. I would therefore like to make an amendment to this, that we have the possibility of voting that the uh, the structure is allowed lay, to stay in place as it is for 36 months, please. I'm not seeing anybody indicating to... Okay. Roger, could you please put your microphone on before you make a comment? I, I do apologise. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Um, and if we keep to the, the conditions that are laid down here, j just to emphasise that they could go through licensing for music. Thank you, Roger. I've got uh, Richard Council Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, if we're going to have a vote on this, could we wait till after the comments have been made? Because I think I don't have some questions, but I have some comments which are relevant. That's absolutely fine. It's as we go with the process. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to open up the floor to comments now, and I will bring you in, Councillor Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. It seems to me that this application has two elements. The first one is the temporary structure, and the second one is it's the music use and that. And I think we should really consider them separately. In terms of the temporary structure, I actually really like it visually. That's a personal opinion, it's not a planning matter. And, you know, I think it adds, that picture we've got up there at the moment, I think it adds to the whole thing. But we have to remember that this is on the edge of a resident, designated residential area. So we have to be very mindful of the impact on, on the local residents. Um, I'm encouraged to hear from the applicant that things have settled down after the event last year. But I think in terms of the temporary structure, I think they need more than 18 months. I think we, we are living in extraordinary times. We thought the COVID was finished. We're not sure yet, but we're learning to live with it. We've got issues with uh, the cost of living. We've got issues about supply raw materials for just everything because of what's going on in Eastern Europe. It's, it's all still very much a very delicate thing. I, I don't believe 18 months is sufficient time for a business. Um, three years seems a little long to me personally, um, but again, um, I don't necessarily like the idea of having two lots of 18 months because what a business person needs is, is a degree of certainty to help build their business. I think that's very important. So I'd certainly be supportive of an extension to the temporary um, planning uh, approval. In terms of the music, I think it's a difficult one because I, I appreciate the, uh, the environment officer's comments about the fact that, in his opinion, what I would deem to be internal inside uh, the temporary structure is, in fact, not accurate. And his view is, and I bet is, in uh, superior knowledge, that it might as well be external if it's going to be inside the internal structure. So that's got to be managed. Whether it can be managed through a process of lowering, lowering the decibel level, uh, reducing the, the uh, late time it can be operated with, so that maybe that, that would help support the business. And then they could, as I understand it, make individual applications for maybe a slightly more um, louder music on the occasionally to fill in. So whether we consider, could, could consider things like that. Those are my thoughts, thank you. I've got a council price. Must admit, Chair, I've gone backwards and forwards on this one uh, every time we debate it. Aberdale Road is a unique road in this city, I think. It's full of quirky, different types of businesses. And that's why I want to encourage this to continue as much as I can. Um, this is related to music, therefore 
it's important, it continues. I like the previous speaker, and look, I like the look of it. I think it, it fits into the environment, it improves the environment, and it makes it a joy to be there. Um, I do question the structure itself, but I do think, I agree with the mover of the amendment, it does need longer than 18 months to get the right together, to bring, build up enough resources, to reinvest in that, to talk to officers on how we can begin to make it more soundproof. Uh, so I, I'd, go, I'd, I'd go along with the 18 months, uh, the three years, I think, in this case. But remember, each one of these on, on Abbeydale are going to come in with their own different applications, and we'll judge each one on its merit. But if I'm trying to judge this one on its, its pers personal merit, they are, they are selling records, they are playing records, and people want to listen to music. I do understand the problem with, with, with although I personally, I mean, I like background music. We have dinners in there and there's background music playing all the time. We're all chatting and enjoying, enjoying it. And, uh, and I think that's music different to, to traffic noise. And I don't understand, especially when you're in, inside another property. But I do accept that the rules are rules and we've got to be very careful on this. So I'd go along with that. But I do think that the, the licensing themselves can look at it as well on, on, on that side of thing. So I'd go along with the amendment, Chair. Um, uh, it's a bit long, three years, but I think 18 months is too short. We do want to encourage this, uh, this place to continue and give it every bit of help we can. So I, I'll go along with the amendment in this case, Chair, and, and, and um, see what happens over the next 18 months, uh, next two to three years to get the thing, so the structure in line with what the, the officers would, would prefer it to be. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Sanger. Uh, yes, th th thank you, Chair. And, and I think the, I, I think all, all councillors have really struggled with this one um, because our, our starting point is we want to support we want to support businesses. We want to have a, a, a vibrant street scene, um, particularly in places like like like, like Abbeydale Road. So so that's the starting point. Um, but the problem we have is is a very much a temporary structure. And these temporary structures cannot last forever. Um, you know, they were they were put in for they were put in during during the pandemic, and it's about what period of time is is reasonable. And I'm I'm very glad that we've got we've got an amendment that we that that, that on the table rather than the 18 months because I think 18 months was was going to be too difficult. So I'm happy to support the 36 months and hope that the applicant can, you know put together a business case for, for and, and, and bring back an application for an extension that is more in keeping with with the variety of extensions that we have on Abbeydale Road and as we, we, we've heard we, we're not we're not going to be prescriptive but it just needs to be more solid and and that could, brings us on to the music side of it and and you know, this is a this is a record shop and they do want to play music and play music must you know play music you know externally at special events but then internally most of the time in terms of background and internally should be where a more permanent extension is so uh, i i'm going to support the original the the the, the, the original recommendation in, in terms of music now that we've had the environmental health uh, uh health officers um assessment of, of, of the numbers um it, it's not a perfect situation but i think you know, I think it's the best we can do in the, in the circumstances, and I, I I hope that the business survives, and I hope that we can, um, that I hope that Abbeydale Road continues to be to, to continue to thrive, and that quirky independent businesses are are, are, yeah, are are allowed to continue. But but equally, the council, both as a planning authority and as in terms of environmental health, needs to set needs to set some standards. So so that, that, that that's why I've come to the conclusions that I have. But I I accept that it's been a really difficult, challenging application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy. Right, I can't see anybody else wanting to comment, so I propose to move to the vote on the um, amendment that the um, time uh, commencement for the, um, it's, it's basically in vision one, isn't it? The time limit for the commencement of development the structure shall be removed on or before the 30th of September 2023, and we want to amend that so that it, it encompasses another 18 months. Okay. So, so is that 31st of March 2025? I don't know. I'll let officers work that out. I've been, I've been chairing a bear garden for two hours. So, um, right. So all those in favour of that proposal for the 36 months, 
uh, retrospective temporary application. I will come to you individually. Councillor Little, are you in favour of the uh, proposal? I'm, I'm in favour of the extension. 36 months, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Price. In favour, Chair. In favour, Chair. Councillor Bob McCann. Against, Chair. Councillor Andy Sanger. Uh, in favour, Chair. Councillor Roger Davis. In favour, Chair. Councillor Richard William. I'm going to abstain on this part. <laughs> and Councillor Alan Woodcock. In favour, Chair. Um, I've just had it indicated to me that um, amendment is carried. So I'm now going to move straight to the vote on the um, application as amended. So a full planning application for the retention of the lean-to timber framed covered seating area um, as amended and the officer recommendation is to grant conditionally. So Councillor Little. In favour. Thank you. Councillor Chris Rosin Josephs. What was the officer recommendation, Chair, as amended? For Chair. Councillor McCann. Against, Chair. Councillor Sanger. Uh, for the officer's recommendation, Chair. Councillor Davis. For the uh, recommendation, thank you. Councillor Williams. Yeah, for the recommendation. And Councillor Woodcock. For the recommendation, Chair. And that uh, recommendation has been carried. Thank you very much for your time. Now we come to the final item on the agenda today, and that's a record of planning appeals, submissions and decisions. Diana, I don't believe there's anything you particularly want to raise with the meeting today. That's correct, Chair. Right. Andy, you wanted to... Yeah, yes, sorry. There were several that, were, that, that, that jumped, jumped out at me. Um, I mean... Uh, so where, where are we? Um, Wheel Lane, Wheel Lane Grenside, which we've been waiting for a, a long time, haven't we? Um, so that's clearly very good news, um, if I've read that correctly. Um, so, so, so that that's 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 pleasing. Um, obviously, disappointed about uh, about Old Mayfield School, David Lane. So, so, so in terms of Old, old Mayfield School, David Lane. So, is, is this a an end to this, so there, are there any outstanding appeals or outstanding uh, issues on that site, any outstanding applications on that site, now that we've got the inspector's judgment in this case? Diana, would you like to respond now? I don't believe there are any outstanding planning applications um, uh, on this site at the moment. Um, I think we, you know, yeah, there are no outstanding planning applications. Um, I think this is the conclusion of the of the proceedings. So, but I, th th thank you for that. I mean, I, I'm I'm not surprised. But, it, but in terms of in terms of 94, 98 Wheel Lane, I, I don't think my understanding is that this is not an end point. That this is just an end to this application. I thought there was still an extant application for, for on on this site. Is that not correct? Thank you. Item seven on the report, Andy. Sorry. I, uh, so, so, I, sorry. Item seven on the report. <laughs> was it was it item three or was yes. it item seven? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. So, so, sorry, chair. So, so I, I, item, item three, page 43, um, as I say, item, item three, two. Uh, uh, my understanding was that that was not a final point. The, the, the inspector concluded the proposed development would have a significant adverse effect. So, so that application is now finished, but I thought that that site, there were still other applications that were within the planning department for that site. I don't believe we've got a live planning application. I, I will double check that for you and come back to you. I'll let you know at the end, of, you know, after the meeting. Um, but it, obviously, it doesn't prevent uh, the applicant from submitting another application, a different application. Okay. 
That's it. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you all very much for your attendance and your contributions this afternoon. Um, the date of the next meeting is Tuesday, the 3rd of May at 2 p.m. So, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.